How's the new year going for you? Hey, this last week, uh, I had an opportunity to sit down uh, with a father, and he has a young daughter, and just before we started our, our session together, uh, which we're doing kind of one-on-one discipling with, uh, he was texting his daughter. And so I asked him uh, what he was texting, and he showed me, and he read it to me. So I asked him if I could read that this morning. So here's a, a father's text to his young daughter. Dear love of my life, I promise you that I'm going to work hard to be the best father that I can be this year. Spend time together and cherish every moment with you. I love you to the stars and back, to the stars and the moon. Stop growing up and getting so big. Now the reason I share that with you today is because God has sent a text to us as well. And I'd like for you to turn to Psalm 139. We're going to be there in just a minute. And we'll have a word of prayer after some introductory remarks. But this particular psalm that we're going to look at, I want you to think of it as a text that a loving father would send to his children. And it's a forthright no to everyone who would try to cut life off with abortion on one end, and then try to cut life off with euthanasia on the other end. And my question is, do these people think that they're God that can determine when life starts and when life should end? Because this psalm tells me that God has wonderfully and fearfully made me. And I can't even utter a word any place, any time, without his knowing it altogether. Look at verse 4. For there is not a word on my tongue, but behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. In fact, I can't go anywhere without his being there already. Look at verse 8. If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell or Hades, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. And I can't even be what I am without his already having me made this way in my mother's womb. Look at verse 13. For you formed me, my inward parts, you covered me, you wove me in my mother's womb. And I'd like to read verse 16 from uh, Eugene Peterson's The Message. You watched me grow from conception to birth. And all the stages of my life were spread out before you. And the days of my life are prepared before I even lived one day. Before any one of us lived one day, our life was already prepared in the womb. And even before that, in the very beginning of eternity, when God had you in mind when he created you. So God was, and he's still creating. And he's not only creating life, He's creating a life. And he's creating that life from the embryo, from the unborn, unformed body, all the way through all the days of the life that's been ordained for me. So all of human life is God's handiwork. It's his idea. Not just from birth to death, but from conception. To death. And I think if that handiwork of God could somehow cry out to us, it's as if the songwriter found the right words when he wrote this. Let me live. Let me live. Let me walk into the sunshine. And let me live. Feel my mother's arms around me. Feel my father's love surround me. Be a part of God's creation. Let me live. See, we cannot flee from God's presence. 
Not only does God pursue us to the ends of the earth, but when we get there, he's already there. Let's bow together. Father, I want to thank you for this wonderful passage of Scripture that talks so much about how you know us. There's not a word on our tongue, but Lord, you already know it. There's nowhere we can go from your Spirit, even before we were ever conceived and after we were conceived and we were in the womb. You knew us, you formed us, you wove us together. We are your handiwork. So, Lord, as we begin to look at this message on the sanctity of life, the importance of human life, as we move this month through the sanctity of life experience of that dreadful decision that was made back years ago, that you'd bring us to your word, that you'd bring us back to you, the very source of our life and of all life. In Jesus' name, amen. Today I'm going to be speaking on behalf of those who can't speak for themselves. I'm going to be speaking on behalf of the unborn child. Now, several years ago, I shared some statistics with you, and I want to bring those statistics forward today. During the Revolutionary War, you might want to jot some of these things down because I don't have notes today because I want you to focus in on on what we're saying. During the Revolutionary War, 25,000 Americans were killed. During the Civil War, 498,000 Americans were killed. During World War I, 117,000 were killed. World War II, 545,000. The Korean War, 54,000. The Vietnam War, 57,000. The Iraqi War and Conflict, 4,282. Now, I don't have the latest statistics for Afghanistan, but it's well over three or 4,000. You add that all up, about a million and a half, two, two and a half million maybe that have died in all the wars of America. But in the war against the unborn, 50 to 54 million babies have been killed since 1973. Now just just put that in perspective. The question is, where's their memorial? Where's their memorial? If you break those statistics down, it would look like this. That's 112,500 abortions every month. That's 3,750 abortions every day. That's 156 every hour, three every minute, one every 20 seconds. That means that during this hour worship service, probably 150 or more babies have been aborted. One out of every three babies that are conceived in America is aborted. One out of every three. How could this happen? How could this happen in America? All because on January 22nd, 1973, the United States Supreme Court ruled that every woman has a right to an abortion during the nine months of her pregnancy. You see, the the judicial branch of government, which is to be a check upon the executive branch in order to interpret the law, has in these last several decades not only interpreted the law, but has generated law and legislated morality. And who are having the abortions? 26% of all abortions are done by those under 19 years of age. Another 33% are 
are done by those between 20 and 24 years of age. That means that all abortions, 60% are committed by those under 24 years of age. 64% of all abortions are done by whites. 36% by all nine whites. Get this statistic, 80% of all abortions are done by those that are not married. As Mother Teresa of, Cal- Cal- of Calcutta has said, to me the nations with legalized abortions are the poorest nations on earth. The great destroyer of peace today is the crime against the innocent unborn child. In destroying the child, we're destroying love. We're destroying the image of God in the world. Now, in order to justify the killing of innocent unborn children, our society has developed this language and vocabulary of concealment and deception. See, instead of saying the killing of a baby... We've softened it by calling it the termination of a pregnancy. Well, you're not really killing your baby. You're just terminating your pregnancy. We made it impersonal by calling it a procedure rather than a person. This isn't a person. Life hasn't begun yet. This is a procedure, not a person. But Dr. Mary Calderon, she was the former medical director of Planned Parenthood, said it right in the American Journal of Public Health when she said abortion is the taking of a life. Now, this is the former medical director of Planned Parenthood. So the answer lies in Scripture. The answer to these lies and these deceptions are in Scripture. If you want to turn to Jeremiah 1, verses 4 and 5, I'll simply quote it. Jeremiah 1, 4 and 5, it says this. You might want to jot that down. Before I formed you in your womb, in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. So even before conception, even before birth, God was forming us and setting us apart early in the womb. Isaiah 49, verses 15 and 16 says this. It's a passage of scripture, I think, for our day. Can a mother forget her baby and have no compassion on the child that she has born, though she may forget? I will not forget. Do you know why he says that? Because he goes on to say, because every one of us have our names inscribed on the palm of God. Would you just look at your palm for a minute? Just kind of hold it up there. Now, can you imagine that every person who has ever conceived, I didn't say born, I said conceived, is written on the palm of God's hand. Every one of us. That means that since 1973, somewhere between 50 and 54 million people who was inscribed on the hand and palm of God are dead and have been killed. Now, I think if these unborn babies could somehow talk, it may sound something like this. I'm one month old today. I'm very small. I feel myself growing every day in this warm, dark place. My heart is the biggest part of me, and it's beating. I'm so glad to be alive. Fingers and toes, my own mouth and lips, and I'm only two months old today. My heart is beating fast, and I feel another heart, big and strong, somewhere all around me. Is that my mother? I'm three months old now. My arms and legs have real bones. I'm growing and kicking too. Can you feel it? I can turn my head. I can squint. I can frown. I can make a fist. See, I can curl my toes. And I think my mother knows I'm here. I'm alive. I'm alive. See, these unborn babies are not mindless bits of flesh to be discarded, to be used in research. They are human beings already in touch with their mother, already in touch with life, and they deserve to live. 
Amen? See, people are special. And human life is sacred whether we choose to acknowledge it or not. Whether it's convenient for us or not. Every life is precious. Every life is worthwhile. Not only to us as human beings, but also to God. See, every person is worth fighting for. I don't care if they're sick or well or old or young or adult or child or born or unborn, bred, uh, brown, red, yellow, black, or white. They're all what? Precious in his sight. Now, if in this first part of the 21st century the Christian community does not rise up with a voice and a strong stand for the dignity of the individual and the right of life of every child, then we will have failed the greatest moral issue to be put upon this generation and the generation before us and the generation before that. We have a moral crisis that is being legislated by our judicial system. I think, you know what's going to happen? I think, and maybe I'm just dreaming this, I think future generations may look back on this generation and I think they might very well scoff at our lack of human dignity and life. I think they're going to scoff at the fact that we will protect endangered species in the life of eagles and yet destroy our very human life in the abortion clinics throughout our land. It doesn't make sense. So today, I wanted to, before we get into another series, I wanted to, to have this message, and it's been preached similar before. It's not new. But I don't think we can afford to let this society and our culture and our government ever forget the impact of that horrendous decision back in 1973 and what it's done to the fabric of our society. Now tomorrow, we're celebrating Martin Luther King Day. Martin Luther King Jr. was a great civil rights activist. But you remember his famous I Have a Dream speech? How many of you remember that speech? I have a dream. Well, I also have a dream. And if I can take off his speech a little bit, I have a dream that someday every unborn child will be allowed to live, will be allowed to have a voice, will be allowed to be heard, will be protected by our laws. I have a dream that from the New York Harbor to the wheat fields of Kansas to the snow-capped Rocky Mountains to the shores of California, we will hear the cries of the millions who have been slaughtered in the abortion clinics throughout our land. Let me live. Let me live. Let me walk into the sunshine. Let me live. Feel my mother's arms around me. Feel my father's arms around me. Let me be part of God's creation. Let me live. I have a dream. I have a dream that one day every unborn child will be able to allow to live and walk down the streets of our cities crying out, free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, I'm free at last. Free to live, free to love, free to live. Thank God Almighty, I'm free to live. Free to have a voice, free to be heard, free to be protected by our laws. Let's bow together. Father, you have a dream of the dignity and the value and the worth of every life. Conception well, pregnancy, conception, birth are your ideas. Your biological scheme for the human race to procreate and to fill the earth. So Lord, as Christians, 
May we go to your word and not cower from all those who would call us whatever names they want to call us and simply say, thus says the Lord. You may forget them, but we will never forget them. You may not speak for them, but God has spoken and will continue to speak on behalf of these children. So, Lord, this isn't a message that is always easy. But, Father, it's one that from time to time we need to be reminded of. That, Father, we would remember the old paths weren't as the good way and walk therein. And that, Lord, you'd give us the ability and the courage to do that. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You'll see in your bulletin, because you know, whenever you preach a message like this, your, your fear is, well, maybe there's somebody that has had an abortion or have experienced it and are still struggling with that or, or maybe contemplating it, even today. At the bottom of your bulletin on the page that has our uh, worship service, there's a, an alternative pregnant center message. I want you to be able to read that. And they have a 24-hour helpline. We support Alternatives Pregnancy Center. We, we support what they're doing in their work. And if you have a need or if you know someone or you yourself are struggling with that or a decision that you're about to make or have already made, this is a great organization. And I would encourage you to be able to make a contact with them and be able to get the help either for yourself or your loved one that may be struggling with this issue. There are so many people that want to have children, that are willing to adopt children. There's all kinds of alternatives for us uh, if we want to take uh, advantage of those alternatives. Gentlemen, if you'll come, receive our tithes and offerings.